a real crime. In a series of podcasts, I want you to travel down some lonely roads with me. These are the roads I traveled with families who never got to say goodbye to loved ones. These family members were fated to live the rest of their lives waiting and wondering. I wrote these stories when I worked as a reporter for the Charleston Gazette. The deaths and disappearances might have taken different turns, but for the families, I noticed many commonalities. Health problems that would lead to early deaths immediately started to appear in the survivors. Family members would walk the same roads where their loved ones were last seen, hoping they might see clues that would help them find out what happened. They consulted psychics. They offered monetary rewards. They called the police officers time and time again. Is there anything new to report, they would ask. The family said joy was squeezed out of their lives. They could not laugh or feel lighthearted if they thought their children were somewhere being tortured. The children of the missing suffered their own special problems. Many families saw their traditions like decorating Christmas trees abandoned. The parents were always eager to talk about their children, hoping that by keeping the stories alive, some important fact might come to light that brought them the answers they so desperately wanted. They kept their phone numbers unchanged. They hoped that someday that old number would ring and bring them answers. Parents would tell me they would do anything to have their questions answered. One mother told me that if she could talk to the person that had the answers about her daughter's disappearance, she would promise not to tell the police. Not knowing literally ate away at them. As they aged, many parents told me, I hope I can find out before I die. As you were here, that hope was denied to many of the parents I want to introduce you to. They died before anyone could tell them what happened to their missing children. They prayed fervently. They wondered if their children were at the point of death. Were those children able to pray? A mother said to me, did my son call out to me at that moment? Many of the survivors I interviewed when I first wrote these stories have now died. Their deaths were tinged with this special sadness that the answers they wanted most in life would not come to them. I will begin this series with unsolved murders, but I will also revisit cases that include arrests because aspects of the case are worth re-examining. Now, sadly, we're all too familiar with the term serial killer, but in the early 1960s in Fayette County, residents were just beginning to understand how devastating that term can be. I want to start this series with the granddaddy of them all, the case that earned the name The Mad Butcher. A Real Crime, Episode 1. As night began to fall in Fayette County communities in the early 1960s, few children waited for their mothers to call them home. A vague uneasiness and visions conjured up from overhearing pieces of adult conversations sent them home willingly. They knew that somewhere out there in the dark, the Mad Butcher waited. As 1962 drew to its end, most residents felt an unimaginable horror. Someone, perhaps even a neighbor, was responsible for a crime never before heard of in their towns. On December 27, 1962, a young boy looking for pop bottles and hubcaps on Golly Mountain found a body, a dismembered body. It lay in 13 pieces scattered over the mountainside. This discovery marked the beginning of police investigations that eventually included seven missing or dead men. Although dozens of other unsolved murders have been committed in Fayette County since then, none shook resident security or so thoroughly attracted national attention than the Mad Butcher. Detective magazine writers cranked out stories about it and a writer from Milton used them for a subject in his short story. Now, decades later, New state troopers assigned to the Oak Hill Detachment still try their luck with the thick, tattered files that grew out of the investigation. Each trooper hopes to bring a fresh perspective to the case and perhaps finally solve it. Retired trooper G.L. Schwartz, who was the first officer to work full-time on the case, said, We never got close to an arrest. We eliminated some suspects. Some suspects were never eliminated. Eventually, suspicious disappearances stopped and no more bodies were found. Because the bodies were so meticulously dismembered, 
Many police officers believed a doctor or professional meat cutter was responsible. A former sheriff's brother-in-law was a suspect. He was a meat cutter who eventually moved out of state. This suspect had a walk-in meat cooler at his grocery store, Schwartz said. Mike Rogers, the victim found cut in 13 pieces, often hung out there, Schwartz said. Another suspect committed suicide. A chief suspect, a member of a prominent Fayette County family, imagined he was a doctor. Police said he had been assigned to a pathology unit in the military and attended a year of pre-medicine at West Virginia University. Sources speculate the man believed he was operating on his victims. He was eventually arrested in November 1964 for destruction of property when he took a sledgehammer to the Laird Memorial Hospital in Montgomery. He had been refused a job there as a doctor. Former Smithers Police Chief E.S. Goodson arrested the suspect after he fled to Smithers. Goodson said the man had a small meat grinder, a child's toy stethoscope, guns, and a knife in his car when he was arrested. Goodson said he also recovered a gun from this man's apartment, but it could not be positively identified as the gun that killed Rogers. Rogers had been shot in the back of the head before he was dismembered. Goodson also took fingerprints of Rogers after he was taken to the funeral home. He said the joints were surgically cut and left no doubt in his mind they were made by someone with medical training. The man was quietly institutionalized. Trooper Schwartz tried to question this suspect after he was taken to the mental hospital in Spencer. The doctors promised me faithfully he'd get in touch with me, but when I arrived, the patient was gone, the doctor was gone, and the records were gone. That was negligence on the doctor's part. Schwartz said, I thought there was some attempt to stall my visit by hospital personnel. My superiors just told me that's the way it goes. Schwartz said he was not encouraged to pursue the subject with a court order. The man was 60 years old and in a mental institution in Dayton, Ohio, when I interviewed him. He also maintained a private residence there. Contacted by telephone, he said he's been in and out of the hospital for long periods of time and has been questioned about other butchery murders outside West Virginia. He could be released from the hospital again, he said. He also said he's allowed to leave the hospital on the first and third Tuesdays of each month. The hospital superintendent refused to, concern, refused to confirm this. She said such privileges are part of the patient's treatment and cannot be discussed. In 1962, Schwartz identified the first victim as Mike Rogers, a mentally challenged teenager often seen listening to a transistor radio on Oak Hill streets. The murderer stuffed Rogers' remains into an army duffel bag and threw it over Gully Mountain, scattering its contents down the hillside. It was a terrible case, Schwartz said. It's kinda, it kind of got to me. I was having nightmares, working on it day and night. Mike's body had been hung like a carcass of beef, feet first. The blood was drained out of it. It was cut in joints like you would butcher an animal. We couldn't rule out it could have been prepared for human consumption. The duffel bag was the only physical evidence Schwartz had other than the body. Schwartz traced the ownership of the bag, but the original owner lost the bag years earlier when he changed buses in Golly Bridge. Friction between the Sheriff's Department and the State Police worked against a solution. State police officers had caught several deputies running numbers. They resented it, Schwartz said. It was so bad that I would go in to interview someone and find out a deputy had been there ahead of me and told them not to talk to me. Schwartz was transferred to McDowell County after a year. He never worked full time on the case again. Among the victims, we have Shirley Jean Arthur. He was handsome and talented, his sister said. The 33-year-old man had just begun a promising singing career. He sang country songs and recorded some gospel music. As a Navy man, he was decorated for saving a life and was a member of the crew to pick up the first astronaut who splashed down. Personal problems made him leave the Navy without permission and come home. 
Although Genevieve Gillen did not know it at the time, her brother died on the same day as John F. Kennedy. Arthur had dinner with his parents in Bradley, West Virginia, November the 22nd, 1963. His father drove him to his girlfriend's home and he planned to hitchhike back to the, his parents' home. He ate a yellow apple and freshly made coconut cake at his girlfriend's home. He never ate again. The last meal we know he had was still in his stomach, his sister said. In Arthur's stomach, the coroner found the yellow apple, the coconut, and some tomato and pepper stew his mother had canned. Some men found a torso December 7, 1963, near Pineville, West Virginia. Although some authorities disagreed, Gillen is confident it was her brother's torso. The stomach contents match what she knew he ate, but his Navy dog tags did not match the blood type of the torso. Several people who investigated the case believe the dog tags could have been wrong or the torso's blood type might have been incorrectly typed. The FBI said it wasn't him. They wouldn't even let us have it. They buried it in a wooden box near Pineville, West Virginia, his, his sister said. Her brother had a tattoo and dental records that could have positively identified him, but his head and arms were never found. A coroner's jury later ruled the torso was Arthur's. Her brother was stabbed 19 times in the heart. The autopsy said he must have been naked because there, was, there were no clothing fibers in the heart. He probably was already dead because there were no jagged edges to the wounds to indicate a struggle. The lower part of the torso was wrapped in burlap and there was straw in the burlap. This destroyed my family, his sister said. My father died of a heart attack at 59, a few months after he was found. He grieved himself to death. My mother had a stroke. Used to be, I couldn't talk about it. I loved my brother so much. During her father's funeral, FBI agents waited in the back of the church, Gillen said. If Arthur was alive and had come to his father's funeral, the FBI would have arrested him for being AWOL. My other brother who sang with Shirley just quit singing. He couldn't do it anymore, the sister said. Seven years after the torso was discovered, Gillen had her brother declared legally dead. Her mother would never accept that the youngest of her nine children was dead. She'd wake up screaming, go find my baby. My father would go out and search the road where he'd been hitchhiking. All through the years, Gillen said she tortured herself, wondering, did he suffer? Did he have a chance to pray? The state police in Beckley finally told us they closed the case. It was just wasting their time, they said. It's been such a long time people think you're supposed to forget. When this first happened, I couldn't even smile. I felt guilty if I smiled. It's just as real today as it was then. It never leaves you. If we could have buried him, we might have been able to get over it a little better. It's not just the one who died. It's the whole family. Another 33-year-old, Sammy Smith, had been working on a Connecticut tobacco farm when he returned to his parents' home in Scarborough. He got a job washing dishes at the four-minute lunch on Main Street in Oak Hill. He did not have a car. After work, October 20, 1962, he either hitchhiked or was offered a ride south to the Top Hat Drive-In. He drank a cup of coffee and said goodnight to everyone who was there about 12.15 a.m., his brother Lewis said witnesses told him later. He was never seen again. Police added his name to those who disappeared during the reign of the Mad Butcher. When I interviewed her, Smith's mother, Eva, was 84. Although her son had been missing for decades, she still kept his room spotlessly clean. She remembers he got up Saturday morning, I shampooed his hair and fixed his breakfast. That was the last time I ever saw him. Lewis Smith said his brother was liked by everyone. He would take time to talk to people. He was good and kind. Mrs. Smith's home is filled with pictures of her family, including many of her missing son. 
She said she dreamed one night her son came to her and stood by her bed. In her dream, she asked him, Sammy, how did you get away from here? He told her, I went with three boys. To me, she said, it's like he's not dead. But having a missing child, that's worse on you than following a loved one to the graveyard. If I hadn't been serving the Lord, I would have been crazy by now. Three other men disappeared between the nearly two-year period from February 1962 to December 1963. They have never been heard from and their bodies never found. The course of their lives, though, share some common ground with the other victims. Whether those similarities and coincidences are by accident or design may never be known. U.S. Army Sergeant James Lee Haynes was hitchhiking from Baltimore to his parents' home in Mabin, Wyman County, West Virginia. After seeing his picture in the newspaper, a Palton woman told police she picked up a soldier who looked exactly like the man in the picture. The man talked to her about his wife and children in Baltimore. She drove him to Main Street, Oak Hill, where she let him out at 2.30 p.m. December the 7th, 1963, the same day Shirley Jean Arthur's torso was found. Haynes' body was never found. He was a career soldier and not a W.O.L. A letter in state police files dated January the 15th, 1965, indicate he was still missing. A frequent hitchhiker, Mac A.G., 29, of Kingston, West Virginia, disappeared after he visited his mother in an Oak Hill nursing home in February 1962. Some confusion among family members over who was to report him missing may account for why police did not have a missing persons report for him until July the 4th, 1964. In the files police accumulated on this case, information about A.G. is the thinnest file. Ernest Gwynn, 76, was a retired railroad worker who rented a room from the owners of the Four Minute Lunch in Oak Hill. He disappeared around the 4th of July, 1962, before Rogers was found, cut up in 13 pieces. Once Rogers was found, police suspected foul play in Gwen's disappearance. Gwen's son, who was 74 when I interviewed him, told me, I still hope someday I might find out something. A seventh man, Lou Bennett, 42, was last seen at the Four Minute Lunch July the 27th, 1963. Bennett, 42, was a mine operator. When his wife reported him missing, police added him to their list. His body was found in Minden, outside of Oak Hill, September the 29th, 1965, but police believe he did not fit the pattern with the mad butcher. J. Zane Summerfield was the county prosecutor when the first body was found. He narrowed his list of suspects to two people. Summerfield sent a skull and some leg bones found by some railroad workers to the Smithsonian Institution for analysis. They were determined to be men's bones, but the analysts could not say with certainty they belonged to one of the missing men. Police were also stumped by the butcher's methods. Rogers' dismembered body was the only complete body found. Rogers was large, weighing more than 200 pounds. Police say it would have taken a long time to drain and dismember his body, but they could never find a place, like a barn, where this might have happened. The straw found in the burlap around Arthur's torso also seemed to indicate a barn could have been used. Schwartz says it's hard to believe one person did it. It's weird. He also could never decide on a motive for killing Rogers. He was harmless. It could have been someone who was sick or it could have had sexual overtones. Rogers was often seen in front of the four minute lunch. Gwen was a customer there and rented a room from the restaurant's owners. Smith worked there. Bennett was last seen there questions about what role the restaurant would have played in the murders and disappearances still abound. A letter originally written in Spanish and translated in state police files weaves a story in which the former restaurant 
figures into the murders and disappearances. The writer confesses that adulterous affairs and jealousies explain the murders. The letter writer named those he thought were involved. Then the writer committed suicide in Michigan in 1967. How many of these men would be alive if they had not hitchhiked or accepted rides from someone they thought they knew? Arthur, Haynes, and A.G. were each hitch hitchhiking. Smith, Rogers, and Gwen did not have cars. People who knew them said they would only accept rides with people they knew. In his own mind, Schwartz never singled out one of the suspects as the killer. I learned in this kind of work that you should never decide this is it. So many things can go wrong. I kept an open mind. Even after he transferred out of Fayette County and retired from police work, Schwartz said, I still keep my eyes open on that case. I always hoped that someone would solve it.